And Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you that it changes our lives. I thank you that it transforms us, and it has the power to do that. I ask, Lord, that you would speak to every single heart, that we take something away that will change us and transform us in Jesus' name. Amen? So I wanted to talk this morning about being ambassadors of grace, ambassadors of grace. God has called us to be ambassadors, and he wants us to bring the culture of heaven, which is grace, right? God, for God so loved the world that he gave. He's a giving God. And so we're to bring this culture. We're supposed to bring the culture of the kingdom into the earth realm, and we're supposed to show the grace and love of God. And so how many here are thankful for the grace of God? Amen. I mean, I am so grateful uh, for, for the grace of God. And God's grace is really his divine influence upon our heart. We talked about that. The word grace means that God divinely influences our heart by his Holy Spirit. The Bible says the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. So if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, God's Spirit is par in partnership with your spirit. Amen. Amen? The, Jesus said, it, 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 it's good that I go away because when I do, the Father will send the Holy Spirit and he will come to you and he will be your counselor. He will be your comforter. He'll be your advocate. And too many times as Christians, we're always saying, you know, well, God's going to change my life or God will God will do it. God will do it. No, no, God won't do it. He, he wants you to do it. Amen. But he's going to partner with you through his spirit. All right. And so. God's grace is, is really his divine influence upon our hearts. It's also unmerited favor. I mean, how many need some of that? Amen. I mean, I need unmerited favor all the time. I couldn't live without it. God is so faithful. And, and, and the grace that we have received from the Lord, right, we, we are to, to extend to others. You, can't, you cannot put a cap on grace. grace. Grace was designed to flow to you so that it can flow through you. And, and, and what happens is a church, if we're pursuing God and saying, you know, I want to see revival and I want to have a transformed life. But you take all the, you read the Bible and you say, what's in it for me? But you, you don't have a heart to give. You don't extend that grace. You stagnate. How many know what I'm talking about? And so this wonderful grace that we receive from God is supposed to flow to us so that it could flow through us. Can you say that with me? Great, God's grace flows to us. So it can flow through us. And as we move into 2018, God wants us to be a people of grace. We're, we're a grace church, amen? We are, we, because it's God's grace that transforms the world. It's God's mercy that transforms the world. And so, but here's the thing. God has called us to be ambassadors, not immigrants. You know, an immigrant actually comes to to a country and has to come in agreement to submit to the to the to the uh, the laws and the customs of the country. I know that cuz you know my wife came as an immigrant and so I sat and did the study with her. She had to write a test. So she had to study the charter of rights. She had to study about the laws of Canada. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You have to have an understanding and then you have to sign off that you're going to come under the dominion of Canada's laws. Camilla cannot come here now and say, "Well, I want to pay the tax rate that the Swedes pay." which he'd never say because it's more there. But anyway, you, you have to come under the law of the land. Amen? And that's what an immigrant is. But an ambassador, an ambassador comes to a new land to represent and establish the laws and cultures of the land they come from. Right? And so we're God's, we're God's ambassadors. And so we've come here to bring and establish this new culture, which is grace. We're people of grace. So I'm a person of grace. And God wants it to flow through us. He wants it to, to move through us, okay? And um, we're going to go to the second slide here. It says, the grace that we have received is to motivate us, okay? The, the grace that we have received is to motivate us towards good deeds. In 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 9, 18, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work 
God is able to make grace abound to you. Why? To motivate you to good works. You know, if, if, if we don't, we have to realize that it's, it's God's grace flowing through us that's going to empower us to change the world, okay? God wants to do that. And here's the thing. It says, and God is able to make, say, all grace abound to you in all things. Not just some things, but in all things and at all times. So let's say that together. All grace uh, for all things. At all times. So it doesn't matter if you're going through a trial. It doesn't matter if you're going through turmoil or you're having a good day or a bad day. Or if someone hurt you or someone broke up with you or whatever. Whatever you're going through, God is able at all times to make grace abound for every situation. The thing is we need to have grace. How do we get grace? We pray. Jesus withdrew often to pray. It's that time of fellowship with God and prayer time with the Father that there's a, there's a flow of grace that begins to come and then that grace comes and then you're able to give it away. Many of you can think even now times in your life where you had maybe more of a season of prayer and how in that time God seemed to be using you more and there seemed to be a flow and it seemed like you were running into people and there was like divine appointments and that. And so the enemy, if he can do anything, he wants to drive us from the prayer closet. He wants to take us away from our knees. Some of you guys have to, you know, put, put your keys, put your socks or whatever it is under the bed so when you get off you have to kneel down. And say, oh, I might as well pray, I'm here. Because the enemy doesn't want us to pray. If we learn to pray, we're going we're gonna to be filled and filled with grace. And now people who pray are more spiritual than people who don't pray. Doesn't mean God, you know, loves you any more or any less. But it's just a reality. Those who pray grow and grow in grace. And God wants us to grow in grace. But good, good works here, we got to realize this, that good works are fueled by grace. And so as Christians, I mean, if, if we don't pray and we don't get an, an influx of God's, God's divine influence upon our heart, the moving of God's spirit in us, if we don't fuel ourselves with that, guess what? We begin to fuel ourselves with, with, uh, with wrong motivation. We start going through the motions. You can't fuel it with your gifts. You can't fuel it with your intellect. You can't fuel the work of the kingdom of God with anything but with the grace of God. Amen. You know, I bought a lawnmower and um, I said to my son one day, I said, I need you to um, cut the grass. And I, I didn't give him clear enough instructions. So I told him, I said, the gas is in, in, it's in the gazebo and I want you to um, I want you to put gas, it's a red can, I want you to take the red can, put it in, 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 and start the lawnmower and cut the grass. And so my son said, okay, dad, no problem. So I didn't give him clear enough instructions. Because there, was, there was a few cans there, okay? So I'm not picking on you, son, just so you know. So I'm, si I'm sitting at work, I get a phone call, it's my son. Dad, this thing won't start. I've tried and I've tried and I've pulled it, it's not working. And uh, I said, really? I said, what, what gas can did you use? He goes, with well, a little red one. And it was, you know, that was actually car oil. And how many know car oil is not the right fuel to make the lawnmower work? All right. So I'm just like, oh, really? So I come home. And, and so I empty it out and I flush the engine. I, fl I, you know, I clean out the best I can. And then I, said, so then I said to my son, I said, okay, go to the gas station and buy gas. Here's the can. And fill it up. And I went off and did my thing. Well, I get another phone call. Dad, it's not working. I said, son, what was the color of the nozzle on the gas handle that you used? It was yellow, dad. Was it diesel? Uh, maybe. I thought that was the one to use. And so I came home and then I'm flushing out the engine, pour, a brand new lawnmower, right? Washing it out, you know, trying to, just trying to get the thing to work. Well, finally we got it working. It, it, it still smokes. It's like blue smoke coming out of this thing. Um, but it needs the right fuel. An engine needs the right fuel, and, and your spirit, the Christian life, needs the fuel of grace. To, 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 because it's a supernatural life that we have to live, and we need, we need the, the grace of God that comes through prayer. Amen? And so what we're doing this week 
is some churches do like the whole month of January is a month of prayer and fasting. And I don't know about you, but I find that hard. So I said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do one week. From this Sunday to next Sunday, I want you guys to pray and fast. But uh, you can fast. You go, you say, what kind of fast should I do? How long should I do it? That's between you and God. And if you Google, you can find out all kinds of information about fasting. So I'm not going to spend time on that. You can say one meal a day, I'm going to fast, or I'm going to fast the whole time. You're going to be brave or whatever you want to do. But I want you to pray and fast. And I want you to pray and fast for grace for your families. I don't want you to pray for at the crossroads church. I want you to pray for your own family. Say, God, I want grace for my kids. I want grace to have its place in our home. I, I just want a fresh infilling of your spirit over my home. Let grace begin to create an atmosphere of grace in your place, in your home. And as you do, guess what happens? If all as individuals, we have a flow of grace and we come together, guess what happens? There's a corporate grace that will transform the whole community. And so I want you to pray, and some of you know God will lead you in how to pray because you have issues that you need to pray through. You have loved ones that, you know, are kicking against God, and you, and you just, it looks impossible. But guess what? Prayer and fasting can break that. Amen. Amen. This is a new year. This is a year of breakthrough. So maybe your prayers didn't work before. Maybe, you know, you've been praying for years, and you haven't seen the answer to your prayer. Keep pressing in, because 2018 is going to be a year of breakthrough. Amen? And so let's go back to the verse here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you that in all things, all times, having all that you need, you will be able to, you will abound in every good work. And the principle here is that we have graciously received from the Lord. And in turn, we need to be willing to let grace flow through us. That's what God is calling us to do. All right. And God wants us to allow grace to be extended to those who are around us. And so how do we extend grace to others? I'm going to give you some, a few points here uh, that we can look at together. And so next, yeah, here we are. Is this uh, slide three? Okay. How do we extend grace of God to others? Luke chapter six, verse 27 to 36. But I tell you, all right, who hear me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. This is a high order, guys. But if someone strikes you, okay, next slide, um, on the cheek, turn to him the other also. If, if, if someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic, all right? Give up everything to anyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. And if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? You see, see how that's highlighted there? If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? See, there's an, a credit coming to your account when you let grace flow. Go to the next verse. Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Again, there you see that question. Even sinners do that. And if you lead, if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. Next slide. But love your enemies, do good to them. And uh, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. And I love this verse. This is so amazing. Because he is kind. Okay, the Most High God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. God is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Isn't that amazing? And Jesus is painting a picture of the heart of God. You need to, you need to love. You know, I was, uh, I was in finished Bible school. My wife and I, you know, we had a little apartment. We didn't have much money. And one of my youth leaders who was working with us had a boyfriend. And he said, uh, I got to buy this car. This car came up and I'm short. I think it was $1,000. Was it $1,000? It was $1,000. I need 1000 bucks for a down payment or I'm going to lose the car and all this stuff. And, and I thought, well, I'll lend you 1000 bucks. I had 1000 bucks 
stored away. So I gave him $1,000. He went and bought the car. He said, I'll give it back to you. I get paid on Friday. I'll give it back to you. Well, Friday came. And I said, hey, man, where's, where, you got the thousand bucks? Oh, you know, something came up and I just, you know, I had to do this and that and the money never came in and this and that. You know, this excuse thing went on for six months. And he would avoid me. He wouldn't pay me and all this stuff. And I'm sitting there going, I prayed about this and I felt God told me to give him, to, to lend him the money. So I'm th- sitting here going, God, am I hearing you? I'm getting, I feel like I'm ripped off. And I, I start, my heart started to get like, angry and callous and I'm starting to think okay, he's going to pay me interest and all this stuff and I'm sitting there going what? and then the Lord spoke to me and this whole passage came to my heart don't ask for it back and finally I sat down with him and I said listen you know I said you're going to have that thousand dollars I don't want it back I'm sewing that into your car or whatever and it, it, it melted this guy and his life began to change. He started getting more committed to the church. Things started to transform. Now, what, what, what was what he did right? Absolutely not. It was wrong. But God spoke to my heart because I was, ex- I was expecting that money back. And so God spoke to my heart through that situation. Okay? But we see here in this, this passage here, three times in this passage, we see what credit is that to you? Okay, other translations say this. We're going to look at a few other translations. Next slide. Uh, what quantity, or what quality of credit and thanks is that to you? Is the Amplified. What kind of graciousness is yours? What grace have ye? Or what grace do you practice? And my question today is, what grace do we practice? Are, are we like our Father in heaven? Are we unconditional? Do we love sinners like Christ loves them? Or do we expect them to change and transform before they receive him? All right, we've got we to think about these things. Next, next one. Seven ways to extend grace to others. Number one, extending grace means loving your enemies. This is, this is a big one, loving your enemies. And the Bible says here, God loved us when we were, we were enemies of God. And there's a whole bunch of scriptures we can go into for that. And you once who were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he, God, has reconciled you. And that's what God has done. And that's the heart of God. See, I don't know about you, but when God reached down and got me in the gutter, I had a lot of sin issues. How many could agree? Let me see your hand. And we have to be the type of type of church where um, we're more interested in in modeling Jesus, sharing his love, uh, uh, revealing the kingdom to people. Not that we don't preach the gospel, but we, we want to show them the love of God so that God, because God is reaching out and love them in their swamp. And that's where God's grace comes and they get saved. We're not here to condemn. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Next slide. I I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant. And this is the heart we have to have. Amen. So the... uh, Extending grace means loving your enemies. Extending grace means loving the sinner who you deem not deserving your love. Loving the sinner. And that can be hard sometimes, right? Because God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I just covered that. And we have to, even though they're still full of sin, we've got to embrace them and love them because Christ died for them. Can I, if you're going to say amen, say amen. Because, I mean, God is calling us to this kind of a heart, to be ambassadors of God's grace. All right? And let's look at um, the third one is extending grace means forgiving and loving and praying for those who mistreat you. Uh, Those who... Is this uh, slide 12? We're good? Okay, here we are. Extending grace means forgiving and loving and praying for those who mistreat you. This is another thing, and this is hard to do. But you know what? You cannot live the Christian life unless you have a flow of grace in your life because it's a supernatural life. You can't love your enemy unless you got God's love in you because we can't love our enemies without the grace of God. This has to be a supernatural thing that is, it, that is filled up because of our prayer life, okay? 
Jesus was able to pray for those who crucified him. Stephen was able to pray for those who stoned him. And I don't know if you've ever really thought about this, uh, but that's a pretty dramatic thing to happen. You're out there preaching the gospel, and you're sharing the word of God, and you're not compromising. The next thing you know, people are picking up stones, and they're casting stones at you. And Stephen was a young man. Maybe, maybe he had a girlfriend. Maybe he had, uh, he maybe had a, a vision of a future, and he wanted to have kids. And, and you, know, he, you know, he had a plan to you know, be a stockbroker. I mean, I don't know. He, 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 had a, he, had a, he had a life ahead of him, and, he, and these stones start flying. And instead of saying, you know, God, destroy them. Or God, judge them. Look what he says. He says, and they were stoning Stephen. And he was calling on God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And I wonder sometime if he did not have that flow of grace in him to say, God, just like Jesus said, Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. If he didn't say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, could God have used Paul the Apostle? Because he was responsible. He was part of that crowd. That's amazing. It's an amazing thought. All right? Number four, extending grace means being generous with your finances to the undeserving. Okay? And um, if you lend to those... From whom you expect repayment, what credit is it to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. All right? And so, the Bible says, Jesus became poor that we might become rich. All right? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's, that's the grace of our God. Always thinking about us. Not, he's not, Jesus was not thinking about himself on the cross. He was thinking about you and I. That's amazing. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 14. Right now you have plenty and can help. At some other time they can share with you when you need it. In this way, everyone's needs will be met. You know, I have, a, I have a clipboard here now. This is a great time for a commercial. Um, how many know, we, a couple years ago, we brought, uh, the churches got together and we brought in a refugee family uh, from the mess that's going on in, in the Middle East. So uh, we have another family coming, and uh, Pastor Luke has been heading that up uh, from the Presbyterian Church. And as you come in the entranceway, you'll see that there's a poster with the details. So um, there's a needs list here, and it's everything from, like, I need uh, wooden spoons, uh, ladles, spatulas, uh, towels, placemats, waste baskets, toilet plungers, and then there's some bigger items as well. But we need to furnish an apartment uh, for this new family. So I, this is a good opportunity. I'm going to leave this at the, we'll leave it up at the front. Um, but if you have any of these supplies, you say, hey, listen, I, I got an extra ladle, I got some extra knives, whatever. Just put your phone number there, and someone from the office, maybe Melanie, will call you this week, and we'll arrange to pay. We should be able to furnish a house, right, with little stuff. And, and so this is the whole thing about thinking about others, giving, pouring out. And so there's something you can pray about, and it'll be at the front. And that list is going out to all the churches, so we don't have to take care of it all, but just wanted to, to do that, so. All right. <clears throat> and so the thought behind this is that, that God supplies all of your needs by his grace and mercy. God takes care of his kids. All right. And so God is always taking care of the needs of his people. All right. He takes care of us. We are to look around and be generous to our fellow believers who are suffering lack. God wants to use us to supply their need. In either case, God is the one who supplies for the need. It's just that sometimes he provides for people's needs through ambassadors of grace. And that's who we are. We're ambassadors of grace. And the Holy, this, isn't a, this is not a, a pressure thing. This is the Holy Spirit talking to you and you just being obedient and giving when God tells you to give. Amen? And so uh, the next one is... God wants us to extend grace. This is number, yeah, this is it. Uh, means committing ourselves to only speak those things that build others up. 
And it has to start in your home. This, I mean, this is something, I'm even as a pastor, I'm working on this. Because you know what? How many know that if you, can, if you can bridle the tongue, you're a spiritual man, right? A spiritual woman. And we have to work on constantly, what, what am I saying? How am I responding? How, you know, what's coming out of my mouth? Because the Bible says, let no corrupt word, all right, proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good and necessary for edification, Okay? That it may impart grace to the hearers. Okay, God wants to impart grace. This is the uh, slide 21. Okay, number 22. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And so, say, my words need to be seasoned with grace. It has to be seasoned with God's divine influence, is what it's saying. The Spirit of God needs to... So our words should bring life, should bring... How many have ever been around a person who's always positive and always lifting you up? And how many... Let me see your hands. Have you ever been around some, someone like that? Okay, Not very many, but okay. It's hard to find those people. But how does it make you feel? You feel good because you're encouraged or, you know, it's not that you can't point out people's issues or work with people or, you know, correct people or bring discipline. Because the Bible says we need to, we need to sometimes rebuke one another in love, right? So I'm not saying you, you just, you know, look over people's issues. I'm just saying that you need to love, amen? You have to impart grace, okay? So next, next verse here. Extending grace, this is number seven means showing kindness to all through Jesus Christ. It's another thing that it means. God has shown his kindness in Christ Jesus. We are to extend that kindness to all, whether we feel that they deserve it or not. All right? And this is something you got to, when you, when you, you feel like they don't deserve it, then that's when you got to say, God, flow of grace, please. Flow of grace. Flow of grace. Okay, I'll even kneel. I don't care. I need the flow of grace, God because I want to rip that person's head off. But you're telling me to love that person. Please give me a flow of grace. And then God will give it to you. You know, if you pray and ask, God will come and challenge you and impart to you the grace to love your enemies. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my own life. I've had employers who have treated me bad, ripped me off thousands of dollars or whatever. And, and I say, God, give me grace. And now I can love on that person and care for that person. God wants us to have that kind of grace. Okay, um, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, okay, made us alive together in Christ. By our own works, we have been saved. I just want to make sure you guys are awake. Okay? By grace, you have been saved. All right? And raised up together with him. And so God loved us so much when he gave us grace, he raised us up and gave us a place of authority. If you're giving grace to people, you're raising them up with your words. You're lifting them up. You're encouraging them. All right? Now, here's just a couple warnings as we close off in, in this message. Number 26. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Okay? And that, that can be an issue in... You know, if we're not careful, 2 Corinthians 6.1 says, We plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Some people do that. They just, they receive it. Uh, and, and, and I'm kind of explaining what that uh, means. In other translations, it actually says, Do not receive it with no purpose. Okay? This is slide 28. We beg you to make good use of God's kindness to you. We, we plead with you uh, then not to fail to, the, to use the grace of God that's been given to you. Okay, uh, don't let God's undeserving love be wasted on you. Okay? Appeal to you not to accept the grace of God without using it. That's another translation. So how do we receive the grace of God in vain? How do we receive it? I'm going to show you. First uh, slide 30. Number one, continue to walk in willful sin or walking away from God after experiencing his grace. And this is something that, you know, people that I know who, who were really touched by God, who, who had an encounter with, with, with the grace of God, the spirit of God came and lived them. They were born again. They're changing their life. And then they continued to walk in willful sin. They knew it was wrong and they continued to do it. They continued to hang out in certain places. They continued to gossip. They continued to just do the things they knew they shouldn't do. And guess what it was, what happens? It, you walk away from God after the impartation of his grace. 
And Paul warns us of that. We should be, grace has been given to empower us to change. Okay? Um, Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Okay, next slide. The second way that we can receive God's grace in vain is get mad at God when we don't understand what is going on around us. And, you know, we all know that it's God, that, that every good and perfect gift comes from God. Amen? And that the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. But guess what? Bad things have happened to all of us. And we don't understand why. We can ask God when we get to heaven, why, why did this happen? How come negative things happen? But the, the danger is to get angry with God when you don't understand. And it's a real thing. And I know people that they struggle with that. They get angry with God because they were believing for a loved one to get healed or something. And, and it didn't go the way they wanted. And they get angry with God. All right? And here's a verse that comes with this. And maybe you never saw it this way before. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one misuses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. We talk about people being bitter with people, but we don't talk about people being bitter with God. Because if you're bitter with God and upset with God, and you share that with other people, then they begin to say, yeah, God never came through for me either. And next thing you know, there's a root of bitterness that begins to flow in the house of God. Instead of just saying, God, I don't understand, but I will glorify you. Though you slay me, I will trust in you, my God. Amen. Amen? And how many know, listen, bad things happen because we're in a fallen world. And we have to just move on and let God's grace heal us from those situations. Amen? Amen? And so the next one, number three, is fail to extend to others the grace that we have received from the Lord. And that is the other one. And I'll give you a couple of scriptures here. Matthew chapter 18, verse 32 and 35. That his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant. Okay. I forgave you all your debt because you begged me. Should you also have not had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers, okay, until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you, each of you, doesn't from his heart forgive his brother his trespasses. And, and, and it's, it, it's like God doesn't torture you because God's a good God. He, but he'll step back and say, okay, listen, you're not going to forgive. I'm going to step back. And then the tormentors come. And when you repent for the unforgiveness and get your heart right, God moves back in and removes the tormentors. Actually, this is a great time for your, your testimony. You want to come up? <laughs> All right. Okay. Faith is going to share a quick testimony that she shared with me last week. Uh, about two years ago, um, <clears throat> my dad came down to visit. It was on my birthday. And uh, something had transpired between him and I where I caught him doing something, which I didn't care that he did. Um, but it bothered me that he did it. And so when I talked to him about it, he denied it. And he wouldn't acknowledge what he did. So that set in me something in motion that I was like, okay, why are you lying to me? And I can't stand when someone lies to my face. So I basically put a wall up and I was like, all right, I'm going to cut you off because I can't, I'm not going to have that going on in my life. So I was saying I was forgiving him and Every time would the Lord bring it up, I'd say, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm dealing with that, I'm dealing with it. And um, I deceived myself into thinking I actually was dealing with it. So as time goes on, um, I ended up really struggling with um, depression and anxiety. And that's something I've never struggled with, like ever. And so I kept researching everything and I'm Googling. I'm like, okay, what could it be? Could it just be 
postpartum? Could it be I'm just not getting enough sleep? Could it be um, just something hormonal? And I'm, but then at the same time, what was fueling all that was the fact that God was silent. And that part was probably the hardest part for me because, again, I've never had that in my relationship, in my walk with God. I was actually very tight in my relationship with God. So having him silent was very hard for me. And so I went to the doctor because I ended up finally just, I broke down at work. And I'm like, okay, something is not right with me. I am not myself. So I went to the doctor and I told him. And so he gave me a medication, which helped. And... It helped for a while, but I had that fear of it coming back. Like I knew that wasn't going to be the the cure for it. I knew there was something else. And I had prior going to the doctor, this was a full year of dealing with this because I went to the Lord and I'm praying and praying and I'm getting nothing but silence. So I'm like, okay, finally I went to the doctor, but I had gone to the Lord first. So Pastor, uh, Pastor Jacques was here a couple Sundays ago, and I was upstairs in the nursery, and I had heard Travis say, anybody who's dealing with depression and anxiety, to come up for prayer. And I had felt like, yeah, I, the medication worked, but I knew that it wasn't going to continue working, and it wasn't, it was just a Band-Aid. So I came down, and Pastor Jacques had asked me, if um, I had any pain and I'm like physically yes all the time and he's like no emotional pain like do you have hurt and I said and I'm sitting there the Lord brought right to my mind my relationship with God or with uh, my dad and I'm like yeah if I'm going to be honest yeah I do I do have some hurt there and some pain with that he's like well, we're going to pray about that and when he did the Lord showed up and he broke it in me because I couldn't even talk to my dad or even think about my dad without anger so much that it would like be acid in my throat. I was so angry with him. I couldn't even talk to him. So, and I had in my heart put a wall up with my dad, which I've never done. I was what you consider a daddy's girl. And when I did that, I was doing that because of my pride. I was doing it because I, was, I felt I had the right to put that boundary up. And I had the right to push him away because he hurt me. And when um, I did that, I was also saying to myself, he was in the wrong. I'm in the right. And he has to come to me because he did this. And I don't have to go to him because if I go to him, he's going to say, see, I was right. You were wrong. And I couldn't allow that. I was like, no, my pride was like, I ain't budging because I'm right. And so I put that wall up. And so when Pastor Jacques had prayed for me, um, the Lord had revealed to me after when I was talking to Pastor Jacques, when I put that wall up with my dad, I put a wall up with the Lord. And that's why I thought he was being, like, I thought he was being silent. I didn't know why, but that was why. But I think was whenever Gary Haynes was in here last, he prophesied over me. And he said it was going to happen immediately. But I had had this in my heart already, and I was already struggling with it. And nothing was moving. After he prophesied for me, nothing was going on. Like, I'm sitting here, okay, Lord, you... This was prophesied over me. Why is, why is this not flowing through? And nothing was happening with that um, either. And so once, once I decided to come up and break that finally with my dad, um, immediately God's love filled me. And I actually could, I think my dad came that following weekend to visit. And it, I was free from it. I, didn't have, I don't have any more hurt or pain or anger or bitterness towards him. It's that restored relationship with my dad and I know that once I've done that everything else is going to flow God's going to continue to move 
and I felt his presence, like I feel he's close again. Everything was restored after I finally stopped being stubborn. <laughs> right. Amen. And how's your health? Getting better? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so Pastor Jacques, I believe you led her in, forgive, in a prayer of forgiveness for her father. And so this is what the scripture is saying. It's, you know, God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. But if you say, I'm, God, I'm going to cap the grace you've given me and I'm not going to extend it to others, God, God steps back because he can't work with you anymore. Like He's still there. He still loves you. You're still his child. But he steps back and then all of a sudden it's like these tormentors come. And God doesn't want us to live in torment. He wants us to live in freedom. Amen. And so, you know, saying all that... Um, as we close off, we need to extend grace um, to others. And um, God wants us to be ambassadors of grace. He wants us to show the world the grace of God uh, in a tangible way by loving, forgiving, blessing, and showing kindness to all people. My last verse is 2 Corinthians 5. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be an offering for your sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. This is what we do. We make an appeal. Come back to Christ. The price has been paid for your sins. Receive his mercy. Receive his mercy, right? And so in closing, I want to, Really, we're going to, if you want to put on a worship song in a few minutes, I really feel, okay, that we're just going to put on a worship here for a minute. And if this, this testimony spoke to you and God is just, you know, just drop something in your heart and like, I got to forgive somebody, then just during the worship, just come on up. Nobody's looking at you, right? We can all stand together and uh, we're officially going to be finished. So if you feel, what, altar call is twofold. Number one. If you've never been reconciled to God, you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to come and live in your heart. You haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to come up here, and I'm going to pray with you. And you're going to leave here transformed, I promise. You'll leave here going, something's different. I have peace, okay? That's the first thing. Number two, if that testimony spoke to you and you say, that's for me, and I need freedom, then I want you to come forward as well. And then, of course, if you want prayer for your health or whatever, we're here as well. Um, so, Father, I, let's stand together as we close. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll just put some music on there. Father, we thank you, Lord, right now for your awesome grace, your awesome mercy. Lord, we want to extend it to our families, extend it to our spouses, extend it to our children, extend it to our communities, God. So, Lord, we pray this week that as we fast and pray that there will be an increase of grace. And, Lord, I pray that you're speaking to every heart in this place. And I ask God that people will come to you today for the first time. I, I, and I ask God also um, that those that feel there's forgiveness issues, that they will come. I'm going to have actually, if Pastor Jacques and Sharon, if you guys can come up here. Can you guys come up? Because if you need forgiveness issues, I want you to come to speak with Pastor Jacques and Sharon. Or um, Camilla, would you come up as well? Okay. And um, Neil, is Neil here today? Marg, you're here. You can come up and pray with me here. And where's Marilyn? Let's welcome Marilyn back. She, so nice to have you back. Marilyn, would you come up as well? And Marilyn's going to be praying for people who want uh, healing or just want salvation or whatever. She'll be over here with us three here. But I really, don't, don't pass this opportunity up. Just say, hey, I just want prayer. This is 2018. I got to deal with forgiveness issues. I need to deal with health issues. I got to get saved today. Then come on up. And for the rest of you, the service is done. And be blessed. Enjoy the coffee.